A collection of artifacts from the Muslim world is about to be put on show at the British Museum. They tell the story of the Hajj, the Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca, strictly forbidden to non-Muslims. Much of the beautiful artwork on show conforms to the religious rules which inspire the rich visual language of Islamic culture, past and present. I can only pray, inshallah, that this exhibition will be a source of education, of understanding and of delight. In Islam, depictions of God and the prophets are prohibited, but to many Muslims, so too are any human depictions or any living creatures. One group would say any depiction is not allowed. Then there is the other school which say it's not a big deal. But on show at the British Museum are images from Muslim history which appear to break the present day understanding of the rules of Muslim art. In the modern period, people take this prohibition in a much more literal sense than they might have taken it in a pre-modern period. Included here are portraits, depictions of human figures, and whole tableau showing pilgrims performing the most important pillar of the Muslim faith. There's nothing in the Quran that says figural art is not permitted, but idol worship is not permitted. So, if human depiction is the source of such controversy, how come art displayed here shows a tradition of figurative art at the heart of Islam for century after century? I'm fascinated to see how the artistic traditions of Islam has navigated this through the centuries. Sometimes they've been at odds with the clerics. Sometimes visual depiction has led to violence, crisis and destruction. There's been no public controversy over the inclusion of these images in this exhibition, supported by the country overseeing the sacred sites of Mecca. But why? Have the rules changed? I'm setting out to get to the bottom of what forms of art are acceptable for a Muslim and why this artistic tradition has thrived in the hidden art of Islam. To understand the origins of the Muslim approach to visual art, you have to understand the significance of this place. It was here, at a cave overlooking the city of Mecca, that Muslims believe the Prophet Muhammad received his first revelation from God. These revelations continued throughout his lifetime and formed the Quran, the Muslim holy book. And it made Mecca the center point of Muslim worship. It's the place people strive to reach in their lifetime. Pray towards five times a day. And the direction in which they are buried when they die. At the heart of Mecca is the Grand Mosque. And at its center, this, the Kaaba. In essence, the most beautiful thing about Mecca is the Kaaba itself. And its beauty is in its simplicity. It's a black box. Um, and it's a black box which people circumambulate. And it's just so divinely simple and yet so divinely beautiful. Muslims believe that the Kaaba was built by the Prophet Abraham under divine instruction as a focal point of a simple message, that there was one God, not the many gods of the pagan past. But by Muhammad's time, the Kaaba had been taken over by pagan Arabs and somewhat ironically had been festooned with icons of their tribal gods. Until in 630 AD, after years of persecution, exile and warfare, Muhammad and his followers took over leadership of Mecca. He destroyed the idols at the Kaaba and re-established it as a simple house dedicated to the one God. This act defined this most sacred site in Islam as a place where the one God should not be depicted. The Kaaba is just something which is the house itself, the way it was built. This is the meaning in Arabic. But in fact, it's the symbol of God's house. 
He's not here, but it's the symbol of his presence on earth where the Muslims has to go and there is no images, nothing there to represent him because we should not represent God. So it's a place without a physical presence, but a spiritual presence. The depiction of God himself or the prophet or any of the uh, figures that are religiously associated, any prophets for that matter, or the angels, are prohibited. This is to keep the sanctity of God who is beyond a depiction, God who is beyond an object. The Prophet Muhammad, when he takes Mecca, destroys the idols in the Kaaba, and it's a very strong iconoclastic nature of that. The fear is that if something is made, it may become an object of worship. People will produce, for example, sculptures, which could also double up as idols. The simplicity of the Kaaba itself provides a constant reminder to Muslims of why there should be no depiction of God or the prophets. A message most profoundly underlined when any Muslim completes the pilgrimage of the Hajj, the fifth pillar of Islam. I've been to Hajj myself, and I tell you, one of the greatest journeys of any human's life is Hajj. What was the most awesome experience was looking at the house of God. But as well as the visual meaning attached to the Kaaba, there is a further reason why artists from the Islamic world have been discouraged from creating depictions of any human likeness if they are in religious settings. In the Quran, there are 99 different names for God, each of them signifying a characteristic. There is Al-Rahman, the Beneficent, Al-Rahim, the Merciful. One of those characteristics is Al-Khalik, the Creator. And it's the reason why so many Muslims believe that when an artist shows the human form or the form of any creature, they're putting themselves in the role reserved for God. And it's the reason why over the centuries, clerics and artists have debated what is acceptable and what isn't. It's also left room for interpretation as to what could be deemed to be realistic or not. Some would say this saying of the Prophet or sayings of the Prophet around prohibition of human being or living entities, a drawing of them is clear and absolute. Well, that is not true because if it was absolute, where would there be so many others who would say it's not? I don't think human beings have the capacity to draw anything real. Whatever I draw can never be real, though it may be a replica of what is real, but it is not real. And therefore I sit quite comfortably not worried about anyone competing with God and winning. You can't win with God. At the British Museum, they are unpacking a unique parcel. In it is a carefully wrapped Qur'an dating back to the 8th century, one of the first examples of a written Qur'an. Muslim scholars accept that this Qur'an is from the Hijaz region of what is now Saudi Arabia, a region which includes the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. The text is written on parchment in an early style of Arabic script called ma'il, which means sloping, in this case to the right. It also lacks any marks or symbols that usually distinguish letters of a similar shape. It was this, the Arabic script, shape and design that led to the first and most enduring element in Islamic art. If it was generally agreed in the early Islamic community that there shouldn't be figural art in religious settings, then the early artists and calligraphers were faced with what to do with the Quran. Because after all, they were part of a tradition where the Bible had been illustrated sumptuously, um, and so there were models for what religious books should look like. But the Quran, if it wasn't going to have figural designs in, what was it going to have? And so illumination was developed and geometry, geometric designs, was something that they'd inherited from late antiquity 
and so the early artists and calligraphers adopted it, used it for illumination. And so you get frontispieces of early Qurans which are geometric because that's uh, a non-threatening type of decoration which adds great luster to the items concerned. There are three fundamental aspects behind Islamic art. You have geometry, which is the foundation. Then you have Islimi, which you might know as arabesque, which is the floral, vegetative aspect of Islamic art. And at the top of the hierarchy, you have the calligraphy, because that's the word of God. Islamic artists built on the Arabic saying, purity of writing is purity of soul. They experimented with the shape and design of the Arabic letters, using the flowing Arabic language to express the beauty they perceived in the words of the Qur'an. I've been doing calligraphy for probably about 10 years now. It started off as an exploration of essentially the written word. Rua Lam is a young British artist. He studied the art of calligraphy in Cairo under one of the most well-known calligraphers today. Arabic calligraphy began with two fundamental sources. One, the Quran, the Holy Scripture, and the prohibition against depicting figurative work in Islam. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the first word that was revealed to him by the angel Gabriel was Iqra, meaning read. This was the foundation for seeking knowledge for Muslims. But also the verse continues, it continues to teach Muslims that knowledge was taught to man by the use of the pen. And therefore, transmission of knowledge was key. Calligraphy binds both knowledge and penmanship in one. These are a few of the letters that are found in the Holy Qur'an, which, in fact, nobody knows the meaning of. These are the, the sort of mysterious letters that are found at the beginning of certain chapters of the Qur'an. Um, and that mystery of not knowing what these letters represent is, is in itself beautiful. Calligraphers were given precise rules for how they should write letters from the medieval period, and particularly with respect to how they copy Qur'ans. The interesting thing was how you should write a certain ligature, for example, in one brushstroke, how the size of a ligature was related, say, to the proportions of the eye, the eye which is seeing it, how the dots, the noktas, related to the ligatures and so forth. So there's elements of proportion which were very mathematical and very precise, which are laid down. And the idea was that you could produce something which was beautiful using these rules. The way the letters were used, even though they may not seem as decorative right at the beginning, in between the 8th to 10th centuries, even then there was a very specific geometry used and there was a real harmony in the way that the letters were fitted to the page and the way that uh, certain letters were elongated so that each line, the margins would be even on both sides and they'd be justified. As Islam spread, the art of calligraphy developed, reaching its peak among other places, here in Turkey, under the Ottoman Empire. Calligraphy is also integral to the decoration of the world's great mosques. The words come from the Qur'an or are names of the Prophet Muhammad. At an Istanbul art gallery, there is the largest collection of contemporary Turkish calligraphy. It is put together 
as a homage to the Prophet Muhammad. In this work, art and belief go hand in hand. Muhammad Rasulullah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Yes, this is um, amazing. It's fantastic. Do you have any particular feelings when you're writing verses from the Quran? When you look at the art forms in the world, you will see that the only divine form is the art of calligraphy, because we are putting the words of God on paper and hence enable people to read it. That's why I can't describe or compare the feeling I have doing calligraphy. Actually, it is said that the heart can only be happy with the mention of God. The same feelings apply to us when we deliver Quranic verses in calligraphy. Alongside calligraphy, the exquisite precision of traditional Islamic design seen in arabesque and geometric patterns, has maintained its appeal in contemporary design studios. It's a language of symmetry which was first developed by the Greeks but then extrapolated and developed upon within the Islamic tradition. So often what you will see is an underlying geometric pattern which you might find in Euclid. And then on top of that, you will find the Muslim craftsmen would uh, elaborate more complex geometric designs which would appear on top of that grid. Um, and then they would hide the underlying grid. The idea is that these patterns are, they're there to engender a contemplative state. And the repetitions that one sees within Islami patterns and geometric patterns allow the mind to think upon the repetition of pattern within nature and the idea of the infinite weave and the infinite movement and repetition of form um, that one sees within the natural world. So this is an example of Islimi or arabesque and to complete a composition like this you'd start off with the geometry, that's the structure. So you'll draw your square and then inside this square is a dynamic square here and then that houses these linear shapes which we call kapala and they're the structural shapes. So you have four of those here, here, and here. And then you have overlaid four spirals. And they're the, they're the structural lines. Once you have those, you can add the motifs. And this, this particular motif is called a Rumi motif. It's not named after the poet. Both the poet and the motif are named after the city, Rum, or Asiatic Rome, which is in Anatolia, the capital of Anatolia and the original examples of this in Seljuk uh, carvings of birds and animals. And as they um, adopted Islam, they lost the representation and, uh, and it became this abstract art uh, motif. It's often said that Islamic art is like a meditation upon the invisible. So you can see that there's, as well as structural principles here, there's a symbolic language in operation also the fundamental link between proportion and beauty. That's at the heart of it, the principle of Islamic aesthetics. Exactly the same notion of proportion uh, between different shapes, between uh, the horizontal and the vertical, between the different dimensions. Everything is quite precise. Of course, sometimes they get things slightly wrong. Um, and certainly the, the traditional argument is that if the proportion is slightly off, then you can, through your aesthetic sense, notice it's wrong. But uh, the fundamental thing was if you got the proportions right, you would produce a work of beauty, and that's quite important. Early Islamic art and architecture also tried to depict the Quranic description of paradise, a concept of beauty on earth with gardens, flowing streams, geometric arches. There's a verse in the Quran where God says that we have taught you how to calculate. We have taught you the science of computation about the stars and the moons and the planets. We have given you the knowledge so that you can navigate your way through the seas by creating compass. All of these indicate to one particular uh, uh, science, that's called mathematics. 
And if you look at Islamic history, the garden, the mosque, the minaret, the mihrab, the pulpit, every part of an Islamic architectural depiction have always been geometrically perfect. The way the ventilations have been designed, they're all geometrically perfect, always correlating with one another, often depicting the five pillars of Islam, or often depicting the uh, articles of faith, depicting the heavenly presence, depicting the gardens of paradise, the water, the fruit, the palm tree. All of these are geometrically put in and inspired by the very notion of maths from the Quran itself. The artistry and the aesthetics of the Islamic world, born out of the constraints about depicting humans and other living creatures in religious settings, have become part of global taste in art and design beyond the Muslim context in which they were created. Many outside of the Islamic world have not recognized what inspired these increasingly familiar motifs. Ah, oh, this is an amazing thing. As part of the Kiswa archive, this gives you the photos, and they're literally like little passport photographs, of the people who were actually making the sacred textiles. To be a Muslim artist has traditionally meant that whether you were a painter or an architect or working with textiles, your palette was made up of calligraphy, arabesque and geometry. And it's just completely wonderful to be able to put a face to these people whose job it was to make the sacred textiles. These particular craftsmen deployed the traditional Islamic artistic approach to the creation of textiles for use around the Kaaba. The mahmal was an ornate cloth brought annually for many years from Egypt to adorn the Kaaba at the time of the Hajj. It would be placed next to the black cloth that covered the Kaaba throughout the year called the Kiswa. So what we've got here are objects from a very, very important archive of all sorts of documents that are to do with the making of the Kiswa in Cairo. The Kiswa being the the covering for the Kaaba. Well, we talk about the Kiswa, but it's also, which is the black covering, but it's also all the other textiles that went with it. There was a special workshop in Cairo where all of these, um, these wonderful textiles were, were made. And what's wonderful about this piece here is that this is the template for the design of the, of the bag. So the bag um, that, uh, that was made to carry the precious keys of the Kaaba that were given as gifts, in order to get the correct design, uh, they made little holes through it um, and in order then that you could be able to work out the design on the textile. The Mahmal has had its share of politics. The Mamluk and Ottoman rulers of Egypt started a tradition of sending this heavily decorated textile to Mecca, accompanying the pilgrim caravans to the Hajj. It would stay on the Kaaba and then come back to Cairo. To the Egyptian and Turkish rulers, it was a symbol of their protective rights over the Kaaba. But to the Saudis, it was a symbol of territorial control and religiously heretical. In 1814, Followers of a Saudi cleric, Ibn Wahhab, tried to stop it. And in 1926, the practice finally came to an end. Many of the traditions which are around the Hajj um, were stopped because, partly because it was an assertion of their power, um, but also because they didn't necessarily want people to associate sanctity with objects. So, uh, for example, if you have this annual commemoration where special cloth is made or, or weaved for the Kaaba and it's, you know, the use of gold thread, very nice velvets and silks and so forth, um, then their understanding was that this was about veneration of a cubic building. Whereas, of course, everyone else understood that uh, traditionally this was about um, the beauty of the place. It was about the celebration of the Kaaba because it was a central focus of the Hajj. It wasn't about the worship or veneration of a building, it was about beautifying it because it was the center of the rituals. 
through history, the rulers of the Islamic world held secular power as well as religious faith. Some faced a dilemma when these twin forces pulled in opposite directions. Little more than 50 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, such dilemmas were being faced by one of the earliest Muslim heads of state whose rule began in 682 AD. If you're an emperor or a king or a queen, what image do you put on your coins? Byzantine and Roman emperors put their portraits on it. Khalif Abdul Malik, one of the first Muslim rulers of the Umayyad Empire, wasn't so sure. In the late 7th century, he was faced with the problem of introducing a new coinage for the Islamic community. And he had to choose. He had the Byzantine coinage or the Sasanian Iranian coinage, and both had figures of kings or emperors on them. And he tried uh, putting a figure of himself on a coinage, but then he rejected that, having issued it, and he developed a completely new coinage, which was solely epigraphic. That means it was covered in inscriptions on both sides, Quranic inscriptions and later historical inscriptions. So figural imagery was discarded at that point for the coinage. Now that is a very significant moment in Islamic history because that means from then onwards, the identity of the Islamic community, the Islamic empire, was focused on coins which had no images on them, simply the calligraphic inscriptions. But other Muslim rulers, as they grew in power and wealth, wanted art to reflect their lives in their palaces and private spaces. They asked their artists to draw pictures of them, of their lives, holding court, hunting, or just looking good. Paintings of this kind illustrate the luxurious lives of Muslim monarchs. These rulers were not bothered by what Islam allows and what it doesn't allow. What stimulated them was voyeurism, power, greed, an absolute uh, uh, chauvinistic lifestyle that they led, almost varying into or edging on to hedonism that we see in the modern world. In fact, maybe mutation of hedonism in a much more graver manner. Artists in the Islamic world faced a serious dilemma. On the one hand, they were being asked to produce work that showed the human form, but to do so would invoke the wrath of the clerics. What they did to try and overcome this was to strike a balance between these two very conflicting demands. Some artists, as a means to compromising between the clerics and their rulers, did depict the monarchs, the emperors, in one-dimensional pictures. So you actually can't make a real feature of a human being or a person. Uh, they all would look very similar because it's one-dimensional. That was a compromise. They did not want to become known in the eyes of the clerics as aiding the heretic, and they did not want to be killed by the emperor for rebelling and being called treacherous or uh, traitors and they came up with this one-dimensional pictures. Bending for themselves, animals gaining independence next in David Attenborough's life story here on BBC4. They were unhappy about the king drinking wine, right? But we also know for most of history they tolerated it perfectly well. Things ebb and flow. Sometimes what happens in the modern period is that we assume that there is a basic relationship between the clerics and uh, those in political power, and that this relationship has been fixed throughout time. And this is clearly not the case. Uh, for most of history, those in power um, basically were in charge. So what they said, the values that they established, the aesthetics they established, the court culture they established, was far more significant than any rules that any clerics would put down. We never find in later Islamic art the sort of three-dimensional plastic arts, you know, sculpture, um, images of, of the ruler in three dimensions. And also, there's a tendency in the figurative art, in miniature painting, for example, not to represent volume. And I think that's probably something to do with an avoidance of giving life to, to pictures so as you're rivaling God. Muslim artists use form and colour in a particular way. The composition does not have any perspective. There is no light or shade. 
The paintings are never naturalistic. They do not temper the edges of their colored areas with reflections or shadows. There are no atmospheric color effects used to convey depth or sense of distance. Brightly colored animals and plants which are supposed to be lying in the far distance are depicted as large and as clearly as those on the foreground. My surmise would be because it all began with wall paintings. And wall paintings tend to have areas of flat color because that's the way they've traditionally been painted. The earliest wall paintings we have from the Near East or Middle East are from Sogdia, that's 6th, 7th century AD up in Central Asia. And they show the stories of Rustam in polychrome, but in different flat colors. And I think probably what's happened is that those have got translated into miniature painting in books originally. And so that idea of flat colors side by side is the way it developed. I think it's a popular misconception that Islamic art is either geometric or floral or calligraphic. The great courts produced artworks that are surprisingly varied and include a plethora of figural imagery. But whilst the great courts may have produced a plethora of figurative images, over many centuries that did not always mean that the controversial nature of such artwork diminished. In fact, one artifact in the British Museum exhibition provides evidence of what happened in the 14th century when the tastes of secular power collided with a more orthodox outlook. The court of a Mongol ruler dispatched this candlestick as a present to the city of Medina in modern-day Saudi Arabia, the city where the prophet himself is buried. When it was originally produced, it had figures that went all around it. And if you look closely at it, you'll see that the faces have been rubbed off. They would have been inlaid and they would have popped out when you first looked at them and they would have been a very prominent band across the candlestick base. And now they've been muted. But these controversies and sensibilities over what can be depicted have not been observed in the same way by one important branch of Islam. The great schism in Islam between the majority Sunni and the minority Shia is also reflected in the development of Islamic art. While art in most of the Sunni Muslim world had this tension between the ruler's desire for figurative paintings and the cleric's dislike of it, art for Shia Muslims developed in complete contrast. Shia theology includes the veneration of members of the Prophet's family down in the case of uh, Twelver Shiism, which is the dominant religion in southern Iraq and Iran, it has the veneration of those uh, imams, members of the Prophet's family, in a way which doesn't happen in Sunni Islam, in Orthodox Islam. Shia Islam traces its beginnings to the Battle of Karbala in modern-day Iraq, where in 680 AD the Prophet's grandson Hussein was killed a conflict over the leadership of the expanding Muslim community. The origin that Shiites claim is the Battle of Karbala at the end of the 7th century when Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet, is killed by the Caliph's forces and that becomes the excuse, the reason, the moment uh, to which Shiism looks back perpetually. It won't forget it won't forgive, and that becomes the driving force for Shiism in the future. Now then, that narrative is about people. And so you have in Shiism a motivation for showing what those people were like. Just as in Christianity you had a narrative about Jesus as a man, as well as in Christian belief as the Son of God. So in Shiite Islam, you have a narrative of the death of Hussein at Karbala and of the other members of the family. And that, I think, is what's behind the use of imagery in Shiite Islam. Just a few weeks ago, I was in Iraq and um, I picked up a poster depicting the battle at Karbala. 
with quite a lot of blood. Um, you know, sort of heads have been chopped off, arrows in the eye and so forth. And it's supposed to be a scene which evokes sort of sorrow and pathos. The function of a lot of the um, art which is associated with Karbala is reminding people of what happened and it's a vehicle to encourage them to cry and to grieve over what happened. Such depictions are at odds with the Sunni tradition, which is followed by most Muslims. And yet, some of the items on display here show that even within this tradition, the orthodoxy surrounding human depiction in religious settings is not always followed, especially when the epic Hajj journey of a Muslim ruler becomes a historical event in its own right. Mansa Musa, the ruler of Mali in West Africa, made his pilgrimage in 1324. His procession reported to include 60,000 men and 12,000 slaves. Mali was the source of West African gold, immensely wealthy, and he carried with him something like 80 camels loaded with gold dust. And when he reached Cairo, he started buying trinkets. And the Kairin historians record that the whole economy went completely berserk. Uh, inflation went up sky high, and it took about 10 years for the uh, economy in uh, Egypt to recover. The depiction of his Hajj journey is among the earliest artistic example, not just of the inanimate features of Mecca, but of the human figures arriving into this undeniably religious setting. Century after century, the pilgrimage is depicted, and the pilgrims. There's a very clear line between the religious context and the secular context. Um, and so in, in secular contexts, in people's homes or in palaces, um, it was quite often the, the case that you could have uh, figural representation on the walls of houses and so on. It's a very different story when you get to the religious context because Qur'ans are never illustrated in the same way that Bibles are, um, that uh, in mosques you never get figural representation and so that's actually a very very clear distinction. Hajj is obligatory only to those Muslim men and women who have the financial means to do it. Before setting out they have to settle all their debts. The date for Hajj is set through the Muslim lunar calendar. Before getting to Mecca pilgrims meet at specified places to get into a state of ihram or purification. Men need to wear two white seamless cloths. Women can wear normal clothes, but most wear white, and they need to keep their faces uncovered. They then make their way to the Grand Mosque and to the Kaaba that stands inside it. They circumambulate around it seven times before going on to carry out other rituals that take place over the next five to six days. Now, imagine I had to tell this story of the pilgrimage without actually seeing any pilgrims. It's a situation that must have faced the most religious of Muslim leaders, and yet time and again, the need to tell the powerful story of the Hajj overcame any reticence about showing the human form. These are my absolute favorite objects within the exhibition. Uh, they're paintings that accompanied a pilgrim guide called the Anis al-Hajjaj and they show pilgrims coming from India and you see the, the little pilgrim boats here and of course they would have set off on these ocean going dows and you can imagine in those days you know it was really terrifying going on these on these journeys ac across the sea and here we see the pilgrims who are described as crossing the sea of Oman so this is what we know as the the Arabian Sea and so here you can see larger ships and then smaller ones because um, once they got close to the coast uh, often they needed to be guided by these, these special sea captains. Here is, uh, before they reached uh, Jeddah, they would stop at Mocha in, uh, in, in Yemen. And again, this, uh, this lovely sort of schematized image of uh, Mocha in Yemen. 
There is one place in the Muslim world where paintings of pilgrims have flourished without the patronage of wealthy rulers. Many of the houses here are decorated with paintings depicting the Hajj journey. It's a centuries-old tradition, and it shows the ways pilgrims traveled there, the people who did the Hajj, and the familiar sights of Mecca. The ordinary Egyptians who are commissioning these paintings certainly have very little in common with the wealthy rulers who are commissioning their works of art on the Hajj centuries ago. Their status are different, as is the modes of transport which took them to Mecca. But what's important to bear in mind is that this tradition that I'm witnessing here is a continuation of the figurative depiction of the pilgrimage to the Hajj that was started centuries ago. Four hundred miles south of Cairo, this area is now part of the expanding city of Luxor. My guide here is Khaled Hafez, a well-known Egyptian artist and a Muslim, who has worked with local painters here and knows their work and style well. These types of Hajj paintings are only to be found in this part of Egypt. This is a beautiful example of how Hajj paintings are. What I find here phenomenal is that it actually documents, just like ancient Egyptian painting, what mm. happened. Mm. So it says it states uh, the pilgrim, Kanawi, Muhammad Kanawi, did visit the holy house of God, and he visited the grave of the prophet with his wife okay. in this year, 2007. Okay, you know. But what I find amazing is that it's, it's the first thing you see. The journey of the Hajj is on the face of the house, yeah. which is extraordinary. There is some sort of a recipe uh -huh. to every hash painting that you find, you know, like in different arrangements. Right. So you have the element of the Kaaba. And then here we have an image of a mosque. Of course, it signifies here the Prophet's Mosque in Medina right. or the Mosque of El Kaaba in Mecca. The calligraphy mm -hmm. is done by a professional calligrapher. Right. And he uses a type of calligraphy called Tholuth, which is the king of all calligraphy types. Right. What is the calligraphy saying? Is it a verse from the Quran? It, or is it... it says that a good pilgrimage only uh, is um, the way to heaven. Right. And then himself, the Hajj, we know that uh, this Hajj has appeared. Yes. The artist did his best to sort of like portray. Right. And he's dressed in the white cloth that you Absolutely. wear when you go That's to the Hajj. Absolutely. Given the sensitivities in Islam about yeah. the showing of the face in, 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 in art, um, do people object in these paintings, uh, the display of the face? No, not, not, you know, like to the locals in Luxor and uh, the practitioners of Hajj paintings uh, on their walls, um, there is no objection to that at all. So this idea of prohibition of figuration does not exist um, in Hajj paintings. Why do you think people to this day still want to make such a statement like this? I think that with the introduction of Islam uh, to, to Egypt, what went very well is this idea of uh, documenting, of reading and writing and documenting everything on walls. Egyptians never lost this trait since the ancient times. Actually, we never lost the figuration in our world. And I think here uh, there is this always controversy between, you know, figuration, non-figuration. In, in Islam. Islam. Yeah. But Islam never abolished the cultural specificity of some parts. Right. Um, what came before? So um, Egypt, for instance, it was a visual culture and a verbal culture. The communities where Islam originated were principally um, the desert communities are more of verbal cultures. It's also, you know, like bragging that we did visit the Prophet. This, um, this positive type of bragging existed since the ancient uh, times. Mustafa, tell me, why did you want your house to be painted like this? It's because uh, the people who want to know my father, he uh, been to Mecca. After he's finished uh, a trip from uh, Saudi Arabia and Hajj, yeah. and then after that he, he came here to uh, 
see my uh, his house, yeah. his painting. Because uh, you want everyone to see that you've been y yes, to Hajj. Yes, yes. The paintings that you find on the houses in this part of southern Egypt don't have the elaborate style with which one associates Islamic art around the world today. In fact, you could describe these paintings as being quite crude. But that is to miss the point, because what these paintings show is that even in the poorest parts of the Islamic world, people are willing to use figurative art to tell the story of how powerful this spiritual journey, the Hajj, is, but that they're also willing to use art to tell the whole world this story as it has been done for centuries. It seems to me that there's always been artists working in the Islamic world throughout history who've produced figurative art, but many have tried to avoid the realistic depiction of humans because it might be seen as putting them in direct competition with God, the Creator. The closest they've come to such figurative art in religion is when they've portrayed the epic journey of pilgrims to the Hajj in Mecca. But one rule has remained constant. Such figurative art has never appeared in mosques or in the Quran. As interest in Islam increases worldwide, so does understanding of its artistic traditions. In recent years, auction rooms and galleries around the world have moved away from calling it Islamic art and is more careful around terms such as Muslim artists. Instead, this work is increasingly known by Sotheby's and others as art of the Islamic world. At the same time, auction houses have seen a boom in interest in art in the Islamic tradition. We've seen an explosion of interest in the auction world. It's partly pride on the part of Muslims, pride in their own heritage and a desire to um, own important artworks. Um, produced by Muslim craftsmen and Muslim patrons over a period of 1400 years. Interest also comes from other quarters, from non-Muslims. Uh, we have private collectors all across Europe and North America and the Far East indeed. And then there are institutional projects, new museums who are looking to build collections of national and international importance. The buoyant market means galleries like this one in London are thriving, showing the work of a new generation of artists in the Islamic tradition. It's intriguing to see how they interpret figurative depiction and to see the kind of imagery they are choosing. This is one of my personal favorites because what's quite magical about the piece is you have the, the alif and the lam and the mean, but it also looks like a musical note. Rida Al Sala runs an art gallery in central London. It showcases works of many contemporary British Muslim artists. I think post 9 11, there was a political shift towards understanding Islam, whether that was a negative or positive context, there was an interest there. Um, that has had an impact on wider international and national Muslim identity communities and has impacted also art being produced by artists that are living in the Western world and their interpretation of sort of geopolitical sort of trends. So there's been a surge in the amount and quality of art being produced around that whole dialogue. Glimpses of the human figure can be found, but they don't dominate this gallery. They appear to respect the inheritance of an audience of Muslims who prefer its art to steer away from depicting people with any kind of realism. One artist whose work consists of modern interpretations of calligraphy is reluctant to show her own face. I don't want it to be about me. I want my art to speak for itself and I don't want to be forefront of my art. So I believe that my art should be good enough to speak for itself without me speaking. This artwork is all about breaking down barriers and overcoming your fears and not allowing your fears to stand in the way of what it is that you may want to achieve. How I've made a hole in the canvas, it connotes the idea of breaking through and not allowing that barrier to stand in the way.
The Kaaba in this painting represents um, an unseen reality, just as the Kaaba in reality does. For me, it represents going back into my own heart. There's a, um, a Sufi master from Morocco, and he wrote, surely we are all meaning set up in images. That's something that's always affected all of my, my work. At the exhibition at the British Museum, this instinctive respect for the non-figurative tradition is also evident in the choice of composition, materials and imagery being used by the contemporary artists showing their work inspired by the Hajj. Idris Khan's painting of the Kaaba invokes the transformation the journey to Mecca is supposed to bring about. The shape itself is based on the mosque in Mecca. I like this explosion of, of words out of a central sort of form. The idea is to try and capture an emotional response to what it was like to leave the journey of Hajj, essentially. The actual structure of the, the piece is made up of uh, different sentences. And I, I guess, in a way, in the back of my mind, I was trying to find out what people leave Mecca with and what they're asking themselves after having prayed in a certain direction for so many years of your life to this incredible, uh, emotional, black cube. What is it like when you're there and then you leave? Does it change you? Especially when they're walking around an exhibition like this also, you know, they're looking at these incredible works and about the journey of Hajj. So as they come here into the last piece, maybe they're asking themselves those, those very questions like, do I want to go to Hajj? What have I learned while I've been here in this exhibition and somehow to try and capture that emotion in this drawing. There's something very nice in the repetition of picking a stamp up and stamping the wall directly with the sentences. Each time you're, you're stamping, you're almost trying to trace the steps of perhaps someone walking towards the Kaaba as well, you know, starting in the centre and moving out. And that creates a credible energy to the centre, which is, you know, what the Kaaba is. You know, this flow of emotion, this flow of people around it and towards it all the time. Ahmed Mathir, a Saudi artist, has conceptualised this in his installation, which he is setting up at the exhibition. A concept which is brilliantly simple and profound. This is supposed to represent the Kaaba. It's where all of the people pray. It's magnetic. The idea is coming from when our grandfathers and the fathers, when they go to Hajj and they came back, they told us we feel something, attraction, for us to one place, to this cube. That's stuck in my mind. And after that, I think about something that has a magnetic to pull you to the place. This drawing or attraction is not just only physical, it's also from inside, spiritual. It's an old, every children have it in the school. It's simple, very simple. Everyone can do it in the home, but it has a lot of concept, a lot of meaning for, for the concept of the life. I build a field of magnetism. So I put the cube magnet above the table here. I put two magnets underneath the table. So this will give you something like earth magnetic field. It's like spiritualizing thing when you come with millions of people around together to one place and yeah. So this is the concept. It is simple art that reflects the profound nature of the Kaaba. This simple building that continues to be an inspiration to countless artists and attracts more Muslims than ever. Muslims are no longer so dependent as they once were on depictions in figurative paintings to capture this enduring experience. It's what I find incredibly moving, that that same spirit of wanting to go there and to touch 
that sacred place and the renewal and all of that I find incredibly moving and that it, it just literally doesn't seem to have changed at all. You know, you may have been coming by camel at one point and by aeroplane now, but actually it really hasn't the changed. The essence of it hasn't changed. The changed. essence doesn't appear to have changed at, at all, but that's just looking at it from my perspective. Over the centuries, the artistic traditions of Islam have embraced a wider range of art forms than has been generally recognized. And throughout Muslim history, this has included figurative art not usually associated with Muslims. It's revealing to see which of these visual styles emerge most commonly in the work of today's contemporary artists. The most common recurring image is of the very place that first defined the Muslim approach to visual art. In some way, the Kaaba itself is almost like a modernist sculpture in its form. This solid black box. I made steel cubes. The dimension of each cube is the dimension of the Kaaba, but chopped into 49 cubes. Seven times by seven times, exactly. Of course, you know, as one walks around the Kaaba, they have to walk around seven times. It's made from steel made from blue steel and then it's lacquered to give it a really shiny quality or like a jewel-like quality which I wanted. And then I sandblasted the daily prayer, the Salat prayer, into each cube five times because obviously you're supposed to pray five times a day. Each cube is unique. They're done with five different segments of the prayer. You have to look at it in three different ways. You have to look at it aesthetically, I think. You have to look about it where it changes the way you think about a certain environment. And, and also whether it actually transports you back to a certain place. For me, it's about transporting me back to a certain time in my life. So therefore, you know, when you're, when you're entering a, an incredible space like this and you see 49 steel cubes that are shaped in the same way as, a, as the Kaaba, which the, the show is based on, essentially, you're asking them to think about making links between now and then. Restrictions on acceptable forms of art, seen by many as limiting the output of artists in the Islamic tradition, appear here to be doing no such thing. The artists we've encountered are not constrained in expressing their artistic intentions within a framework that sets out clear boundaries. The rules they understand around figurative representation are informing, not constraining them. Today, artists in the Islamic tradition are creating art which has as much power as that of any artist. But now in Mecca, the surroundings of the Kaaba are changing. The Grand Mosque and its environment are part of a huge redevelopment of the city as visitors reach record numbers and are set to rise even more in the years to come. But will artists of the future still continue to find inspiration here when the Kaaba itself appears to be on the verge of being dwarfed by its surroundings. Will these changes put at risk that simple beauty of this most important building, the Kaaba, carrying as it does so much influence over the beliefs, the practice and the art of Islam? Bending for themselves, animals gaining independence next in David Attenborough's life story here on BBC Four.